This week, we're going to cover the second part of the behaviorism lecture. We're going to learn about several of the neo-behaviorists, including B.F. Skinner, who contributed to the expansion of this school of thought in the 1920s and the 1930s. We will learn about some of the events that contributed to the expansion of behaviorism. We will look at the contributions of Edward Tolman, Clark Hull, and B.F. Skinner. We will finish with just a brief comparison of operant conditioning and classical conditioning. Let's start with the zeitgeist of the 1920s and the 1930s. There were several things going on during the time that helped behaviorism become such a popular and important force in psychology. Had it not been for these four things we're going to cover on the next few slides, behaviorism may not have become as popular as it did at the time. It may have happened earlier, it may have happened later. The important thing to remember is that these four things, these four reasons contributed to the expansion of behaviorism in the 1920s and the 1930s. Reason number one, Americans wanted a practical psychology, something that could help them raise their children, improve their marriages, do better at work, change things in their communities, they wanted psychology to provide value to their everyday lives. And we've already talked about this reason in several other lectures. I'm just bringing it up once again to show you that this idea, this very American idea was important to the field of psychology. It impacted the expansion of behaviorism, gestalt psychology, applied psychology, mental testing. All of these different ideas were able to grow within the field of psychology because they attempted to provide everyday value and be useful to the everyday American citizen, not just psychologists. Reason number two, Ivan Pavlov's work was translated into English. He published it in Russian. It took several years before it was all translated into English for American psychologists. Once they got their hands on his methods, his procedures, his descriptions of how he conducted his experiments, they were blown away. And eventually his whole program of research would become a model for American psychologists and American psychology departments. The training that we all receive today in graduate school is very much connected to Ivan Pavlov's program of research. The way that he went about conducting his research influenced how we conducted research in the field for decades. And there are still things today that we do that Pavlov did, things that he introduced to the field of psychology. Reason number three, a physicist, Percy Bridgman, introduced several concepts in 1927. And these concepts became of interest to American psychologists. Logical positivism and operationalism. These are two fancy terms for concepts that you are probably familiar with today if you've taken research methods. The first one, logical positivism, is the idea that the observable behaviors should be distinguished from the unobservable. Things like emotions, thoughts, motivation. Those two things should be distinguished. And the focus should be on the observable. Unobservable entities, unobservable processes can be studied only if they can be tied to the observable, to behaviors. So according to this idea, and remember, this idea comes from physics, not from psychology. The idea is you have to be able to see something in order to study it. 
we can make inferences about the things we can't see so long as we have observable evidence, so long as we can see some things, we can make broader conclusions. Now, his second idea, operationalism, has to do with how we define, how we operationalize our concepts, our variables in our studies. In the field of physics, it was very important for researchers to be clear about what they were studying. Hence, this idea of defining, you know, concepts, not so much in, in absolute terms, but relative to our situation. How are we defining these different variables that we're studying? So, for instance, if we're looking at something like hunger, like many of the early psychologists and physiologists did, if we're looking at something like hunger and we ask the question, you know, how does hunger influence emotions? Think about those Snickers commercials we all see, right? If you don't eat, if your blood sugar is low, you're cranky. Let's investigate that. How does hunger impact emotions? Well, Bridgman and psychologists alike would want to know, what do you mean by hunger? What do you mean by emotions? How are you defining that? How are you going to measure that? What exactly do you mean when you say hunger? Are you just going to ask people on a scale from zero to 10, how hungry are you? Are you going to take samples from their blood? Are you going to test their blood sugar? Are you going to wait until people pass out? What is, what is your plan here? How are you going to study these variables? You wouldn't be able to wait until people passed out, by the way, but how are you in your study defining your variables? This idea of defining our variables very specifically and in relation to our study, um, this idea comes from the late 1920s and it comes from a physicist. Reason number four, after World War I, there were four people, Guthrie, Tolman, Hull, and B.F. Skinner, who completed their doctorates and began studying their own topics, their own ideas. They all shared several things in common. They used the experimental method. Behaviorists did not use introspection or subjective methods like it. They relied on the experimental method. They tried to maintain control over different variables in their studies. They conducted them mostly in labs and mostly with animals. At least at first, behaviorists studied animals. Later, there was more pressure for them to more directly study human behavior. But at first, they focused mostly on, on small animals, just like the physiologists did in the 1800s. Rats, bunnies, pigeons, they are easy to breed. They're easy to keep in cages and just clean up after. They don't require a lot of space, a lot of training. They were very convenient for many of the early physiologists and early behaviorists. Obviously, behaviorists focused on behavior, but they also paid attention to the environment. Remember Charles Darwin. Darwin said that we change, we evolve based on the environment. Many of the functionalists and behaviorists had similar ideas about behavior. The reason we all act the way that we do is because it provides us some kind of advantage in our environment. If our environment changes, then our behaviors might need to change as well. So they were interested in how the environment shapes our behaviors. They were also interested in learning. They wanted to know how do animals learn? How do they remember? How do they learn best? What kinds of things prevent learning from happening? They were interested in all the ins and outs of how animals and humans learn. Ultimately, their goal was to control behavior to be able to predict a behavior 
according to the environment and then to be able to make changes to that environment to impact that behavior. The ultimate goal was predict and control behavior. I want to start with someone that very few of us are familiar with, Edward Tolman. Let's look at his biography and then some of his contributions to behaviorism. Tolman earned his PhD in psychology in 1915 from Harvard University. Harvard was a very popular place to study psychology. It still is today. It was just as prestigious back then as it is today as well. In graduate school, Tolman was introduced to behaviorism by Robert Yerkes, an applied psychologist that we learned about a few weeks ago, and he was introduced to Gestalt psychology by Kurt Kafka. Tolman had experiences with two Yerkes and Kafka of the most popular, famous psychologists at the time. These connections were certainly helpful in helping him expand his career, just as these connections would be useful today. Tolman would take these different ideas and combine them to create his neo-behaviorism, his new behaviorism. He, like many other behaviorists, really relied on the experimental method to test his ideas. Some psychologists at the time would come up with these theories, these ideas, but then they wouldn't test them. They would write about them and write about them and write about them, but never conduct the kind of high quality research that would allow them to figure out whether these, these statements, these ideas are applicable to most people. So Tolman was a big promoter of using the experimental method to identify the ideas, the principles that are of practical value. He studied Titchener's structuralism and was exposed to those ideas, but introspection prevented structuralism from becoming a more prominent force in psychology. Tolman did not like introspection, did not think that it met the same standards as the experimental method that was being used in the natural sciences. Tolman preferred experiments over introspection. One of the other things that I think is important to mention about Tolman, he was not afraid to be wrong. He wanted other researchers to test his ideas and make sure that the things he was putting out there were being confirmed by other people, that he was not the only one to observe and confirm his ideas. He encouraged that research cycle. He encouraged the testing of one another's ideas. Some of the early psychologists became annoyed when new researchers would publish studies in direct conflict with their original ideas. Tolman was not one of those people. He encouraged his graduate students and his colleagues to test his ideas and prove or disprove um, his own hypotheses. For many years, Tolman taught comparative psychology and spent a lot of time in the laboratory studying rats. At first, Tolman followed in Watson's footsteps. He promoted the same ideas that Watson had promoted. Eventually though, he became dissatisfied with those ideas because they didn't completely explain behavior. So he came up with his own ideas. His system was called purposive behaviorism. And basically what he did, he paid attention not only to observable behaviors, the way that the rats behaved, responded, how they learned, but he also paid attention to goal orientation. He documented the goals the motives of different behaviors. Why did rats do certain behaviors in some situations, but not in other situations? How do those situations change the goals of the animal? How does goal orientation impact how animals behave? He promoted the idea that behavior is 
goal oriented, that behavior is motivated by some internal force that we can't observe, but that we can draw conclusions about by observing the behaviors that are associated with said motives. This idea that the internal impacts the external was not necessarily a new idea. He was drawing attention to yet another variable that we needed to pay attention to when trying to explain behavior. According to Tolman, behavior is the means to an end. The behavior is the way that we get certain things that we want. So we need to pay attention to how animals are driven, what motivates them, their goals, in order to understand why they behave the way that they do in certain situations. His learning theory was what we call a cognitive approach. He paid attention to these internal drives and how these internal drives impacted how the animal made decisions about how to behave. He predicted that when a task is repeated over and over again, the association that develops and strengthens the association that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, this association includes not only the stimulus and the response, but also includes cues in the environment so there's probably more than one stimulus. It's probably a group of stimuli that are actually eliciting that behavior. So we've got to pay attention to those cues in the environment, but then we also have to consider the animal's expectations, how the situation changes, how the animal thinks about the situation. Many behaviorists paid attention to the behavior and ignored some of these internal drives. Tolman really brought the focus back on both. Tolman also introduced another important concept, one that we rely on today, intervening variables. He defined intervening variables as the things within the organism that actually determine behavior. There's a reason we behave the way we do that reason is known as an intervening variable. We may not be able to see that variable, we may not be able to measure it, but it is in fact the real cause of behavior. He proposed several different categories of things that might actually cause behavior. Environmental stimuli, physiological drives, heredity, previous training, and age. All five of these things, he said, are going to impact behavior. They're going to be the real reason that we see the behaviors that we see. In order to understand behavior, we need to pay attention to all of these things. We need to try to control these variables when we can through different experimental methods, through different ways of assigning groups. Sometimes we use quasi-experimental methods um, to study biological uh, variables. Think about it, previous training. These animals in Pavlov and Watson and Skinner's studies, these animals were likely influenced by the experiments that they had participated in the day before, the week before, the month before. This was a really important concept to introduce and to promote. We today follow Tolman's you know, rules, his principles in terms of you know, how to study behavior, pay attention to all these different things, not just the observable behavior. Um, but back then it was uh, a fairly revolutionary idea. So thanks to Tolman, we have very precise ways of measuring the observable and drawing conclusions about the unobservable. One of the other things that Tolman promoted was the idea that we need to separate learning from 
the performance of the task we want the animal to learn, we need to separate those two processes instead of assuming that the learning process is impacted the same way that the performance process is impacted, we need to consider how things in the environment might have a different impact on the two processes. For instance, rewards impact performance. If we give different types of rewards, rats perform differently based on the type of reward that we, that we provide. Sometimes though, when we don't provide any type of reward, although the rats may not perform, they may not do what we want them to do, they, they do still learn. They, they are capable of learning even though they can't perform. The way they learned and the way they performed are influenced differently by the things that that Tolman identified, things in the environment, things within the animal, training, age, and the like. In one of Tolman's studies where he looked at how rats learn in mazes, he demonstrated that animals can sometimes learn below awareness even when no rewards are present. So animals can still pick up on new information even when they're not being rewarded for it directly and even when they're not motivated, not paying attention to that new information. In one of these studies, he had three different groups of rats and he taught them how to run through the same maze. The first group never received a reward. They were taught how to go through the maze, but it took them a really long time to catch on because there was no motivation. There was no real reason for them to figure out which corridor to go down, how to get to the end of the maze. There was nothing there for them at the end. As a result, they showed very little improvement. And like I said, it took a really long time for them to figure out how to get through the maze. With the second group of rats, they always received a reward at the end of the maze. This second group that was always rewarded, they from the beginning of the experiment showed steady improvements in performance when they would be tested on their knowledge of the maze, they were able to perform better each time. The third group did not receive rewards for the first 10 days. And like the first group, they made a whole bunch of errors. It took them forever to figure it out. And they usually completed the maze slowly. It took them longer to complete the maze if they completed it at all. On the 11th day, the third group who had not received any rewards up until this point started receiving rewards every single time. This third group immediately showed steady improvements in performance. They immediately were nearly at the same place that the other rats who had been rewarded this whole time, they were nearly at the same level of performance. It's almost like for those first 10 days, they were learning stuff, but just had no reason to use it, had no reason to perform it, so they didn't. It wasn't until they started to receive the reward that they demonstrated their knowledge. They demonstrated how much they had learned. The same kind of thing can happen with humans. We all probably have at least one example of how we learned something without realizing we learned it. It wasn't until we were called upon to demonstrate that knowledge that we realized, oh wow, I, I knew that. I didn't know I knew that, but now I know I knew that. As you can see, many of Tolman's ideas are still relevant to the study of psychology today. And there's one more idea that was important to how behaviorism developed. 
the early years of behaviorism were focused on these associations between stimuli and responses, stimuli and responses. The idea was that we learn by strengthening those associations. Every once in a while, someone would come along and say, there's something else. There's something else that we're not paying attention to. There's something else that we've been ignoring all of these years. Tolman was one of those people. He demonstrated with many of his rat studies that the rats weren't necessarily strengthening these stimulus response associations. They were learning the environment. They were making a map of the maze in their minds and then using that map to make decisions about how to behave. So for a long time, for instance, researchers assumed that the reason a rat would turn left at a certain doorway instead of going down the hallway and taking the next right, many psychologists assumed that the rat had memorized that motion. That doorway elicits a left response. Some behaviorists said the rats memorized the feeling of going through the maze. They remember going a certain distance and then turning. Tolman had another explanation. He said that the rats built a cognitive map of their environment. In the 1920s and 30s, there were several neo-behaviorists who were helping carve out the path for this school of thought. I won't cover all of them, of course, in this lecture, we don't have time, but I do want to show you some of the work of Clark Hull. I think his ideas are interesting and he did have a significant impact on behaviorism. So let's take a look at some of Hull's contributions. Clark Hull was born in New York in what your textbook calls pioneer conditions. His family was extremely poor. As a young boy, he had typhoid fever and polio. Both of these diseases resulted in some physical disabilities and some psychological limitations as well. Despite his poor health and despite his poor finances, he was an incredibly ambitious young man and wanted nothing more than to make a career for himself. He was very much interested in engineering, the design and construction of things when he was a young boy, and he carried that passion for engineering throughout his life, even as he contributed to the field of psychology. In 1918, during World War I, he earned his PhD from the University of Wisconsin. He worked with Joseph Jastro, who studied with G. Stanley Hall. Jastro taught Hull about Darwin's ideas, about Hall's ideas. Jastro had a big impact on some of the, the early psychologists. For this reason, Hull was influenced by Charles Darwin, Ivan Pavlov, John Watson, and Edward Thorndike. Now, I don't talk about Thorndike in the behaviorism lecture. I do want to emphasize that he is considered a contributor to behaviorism, but he is also associated with functionalism. That's why we talked about Thorndike a few lectures ago. Thorndike is the bridge between functionalism and behaviorism. So keep that in mind. But all of these people influenced Hull's ideas, and he would eventually be considered a neo-behaviorist by historians in the field of psychology. After he was introduced to psychology and the experimental method, he created a machine that could calculate correlations between variables, an early version of SPSS. 
1929, Hull started working at Yale University at its Institute of Human Relations. It was here that he started to develop his learning theory. His major idea was that human behavior could be explained with mathematical laws. When you think of Hull, I want you to think of math and I want you to think of Isaac Newton. Newton had a similar idea when it came to physics and mechanics, not human behavior. Newton believed that math could be used to explain things like motion, physics, mechanics. Hull tried to apply a similar idea that we could explain the way the mind works and the reason for behavior using math, using these fancy equations. And so we'll look at some of those equations on the next slide. But first I wanted to explain this mechanical idea of holes. He also said that we would never truly understand human behavior unless we were able to build a machine, a robot that acted just like humans. If we could get to that point where we could create a robot, not like Hollywood robots, but like a robot that no one would be able to know is not human. If we are able to do that, then we know we fully understand human behavior. At first, this idea may sound a bit unusual, but if you think about it, what he's, what he's trying to say is that we will never fully understand human behavior. It is so complex. There are so many moving parts, but he understood that we were, are, very limited in our ability to fully explain human behavior. It is just way too complex to be able to fully capture with some mathematical equations. He still tried, but also recognized some of those limitations. The GIF that you can see here on your slide is an illustration of where we are today in terms of building robots that mimic humans. This particular robot has been designed to express some of the universal human emotions like happiness and surprise and fear. But we are a long way away from creating a machine that acts exactly like human beings. Hull earned his PhD in 1918 during World War I and then he worked in the 20s, in the 30s, in the 40s to try to expand behaviorism through his own work. In 1943, he published a book and outlined 16 different principles of behavior. Now, we're not going to go through all 16 principles, but I do want to show you some of his ideas and then show you a few examples to illustrate those ideas. Like many behaviorists at the time, he tried to explain behavior through these associations between stimulus and response, between the S and the R. He said these associations grow, strengthen through learning. That's the process that is responsible for creating these associations. And the strength of this association, he called habit strength. So he sort of referred to that association as a habit and then called the strength of that habit, habit strength. And he had a little formula that he used to designate this strength. According to Hull, habit strength is higher when there are reinforcers present, when those reinforcers serve to minimize or eliminate a biological drive, hunger, thirst, rest. And when the number of reinforced trials is higher than when it's lower. If you're trying to teach your pet how to do a trick, you know that 
some type of reward must be present. It's really hard to teach an animal how to do anything if you don't show the animal that what they're doing is a good thing. Some of us use treats, praise, play to reward our animals and encourage them to keep doing what we're asking them to do. When we practice again and again and again, when those trials are many instead of few, our animal tends to learn. Over time, through repeated trials and the presence of rewards, especially food rewards, over time, habit strength can grow. And this is how learning happens. Learning is a gradual accumulation of habit strength. It happens slowly over time. The more trials, the more practice, the more those trials are reinforced, the more likely that the strength grows and the animal learns. Here is another one of Hull's equations, reaction potential. This is the probability that a given reaction will occur given the situation. So think of it like, what is the potential for a specific reaction? What is the likelihood that the pigeon will actually peck at the ping pong ball? He believed there was an equation that we could use to calculate this probability. And I have that information here on the slide for you. Now the real equation is more complicated than what I have here. But essentially, reaction potential, the likelihood that an animal or a human will behave in a certain way is a function of several different variables. Habit strength, drive, their motivation, how hungry they are, both literally and figuratively, and the incentives, the reinforcers, the rewards that are present. According to Hull, reaction potential is high when all three of these variables are high. When the organism is driven, when rewards are present, and when habit strength, which we just talked about on the previous slide, when habit strength is high. That same behavior is less likely when habit strength is low, when drive is low and when there are no rewards present. It is very unlikely that the organism will exhibit that response. It's not impossible. It just means that it's very unlikely. The potential is, is very low. Let's take a look at two examples to help illustrate Hull's ideas. What is the reaction potential that a hungry child will cry when grandma or grandpa doesn't buy them candy in the checkout aisle. In our example, the stimulus is going to be the word no. That's going to be the trigger, the point at which the child will have to decide how to respond. The response that we're looking at, the response that we're trying to predict is crying. That association for children is pretty high. The word no triggers crying or whining or screaming or sometimes getting kicked in the shin. This strength then is probably high for our example. There's a strong connection between the S and the R, between the stimulus and the response. Plus, we also know that the child is hungry. They're in a grocery store with grandma. They're hungry, cranky. That drive, that hunger drive is going to be higher in this situation than it would right after eating a meal. There are several reinforcers available in the environment, grandma's attention, whether it's positive or negative, and the candy. If both of these things are provided, if the grandparent coddles the child, if the grandparent ends up buying the candy, they are reinforcing that behavior because they are strengthening the association between no and crying. It not only creates a problem in that instant, but in the future, according to Hull, it's going to be more likely than that the crying happens because of no. So in our example, because all three of the things that he said needed to be present 
are present, uh, it, there's a high likelihood that this child is going to cry when grandma says no. The problem is, of course, human behavior is not as systematic as physics and mechanics, and humans are full of all kinds of idiosyncrasies and complexities that make it so that we can't predict with 100% certainty how someone or how an animal is going to behave in a specific situation. We can get really close, but we can't do it with 100% certainty. Let's look at another example. Example number two, what is the reaction potential that a student with a 4.0 GPA, 100% in the class and perfect attendance, what's the likelihood that the student will skip class on a beautiful day? The stimulus that we're looking at in this example is the beautiful day, the weather, and the response that we're trying to predict is the skipping of class, not going to class because the weather is really nice. What's the likelihood that this particular student will skip class? Habit strength is probably low. There've been many beautiful days before and the student hasn't skipped. That habit, that strength is minimal. In this example, drive is probably low because the student doesn't appear to have any direct needs. They are getting a good grade in the class, doesn't seem like skipping class would cause many issues with their grade if they skip just this one time. If skipping class will meet the student's need in some way, then we might say drive is high. But the way that the example is presented, let's just assume that drive is low. There is one potential reinforcer here, the idea that skipping class could result in some relaxation. Regardless of whether relaxation is needed, it could be a motivator here. It could be one of the things that uh, will reinforce the behavior. In this example, I would say there's a low probability that the student will skip class on a beautiful day. And really it just has more to do with, this isn't something the student normally does. The student really doesn't need to skip class, isn't driven to skip class. So I would say using Clark's equation, I would say there's a low probability that this particular student will skip class even on a beautiful day. Of course, there's a lot of variables that I didn't present in this tiny example. So if you added a couple of words, if you added a couple sentences to either one of these examples, it may change, um, you know, how we label habit strength, drive, and uh, reaction potential. Although Watson is known as the founder of behaviorism, B.F. Skinner is the most famous behaviorist. So let's take a look at his work now. Burris Frederick Skinner was an American psychologist who is best known for his operant conditioning studies. He first encountered behaviorism when he read John Watson's work. And then when he got into graduate school, he decided to study psychology and come up with his own form of behaviorism. He became popular in part because he was really good at recruiting graduate students to come and work with him and then really good at getting their studies and his studies published, which helped them get jobs after graduate school and spread Skinner's behaviorist ideas to other universities and even more students. In that way, Skinner is similar to Wilhelm Wundt. He, remember, supervised 186 dissertations, which meant that 186 people went out into the psychology departments in the late 1800s and early 1900s and spread these early ideas of wants. The same thing happened with Skinner. He was a likable guy, his graduate students wanted to work with him. They published a lot. This helped spread his ideas. Eventually, his work overshadowed the other neo-behaviorists like Hull and Tolman. He became so 
famous that in 2002, the APA, the American Psychological Association, named Skinner the most influential psychologist of the 20th century. Not just the most famous, but the most influential, the person who influenced the field, the subfields. Eventually, Skinner's work overshadowed the other neo-behaviorists like Hull and Tolman. Skinner became so prominent in the field of psychology in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, that the APA named him the most influential psychologist of the entire 20th century. They gave out this award in 2002, which is a big deal. Of all of the people that we talk about this semester, Skinner was labeled the most influential. Not the most popular, not the most famous, but the most influential psychologist in the entire century. That's impressive. Skinner was born in Pennsylvania to extremely hardworking parents who, like many of our parents, used rewards and punishments to shape his behavior. From an early age, he said his parents taught him to fear three things, fear God, fear the police, and fear what other people will think of you. And what he meant by this, he didn't mean be afraid of all these different things, but his parents wanted him to obey the rules of society, to contribute to his community instead of B.F. Skinner was born in Pennsylvania to extremely hardworking parents who, like many of our parents, used rewards and punishment to shape his behavior. As a child, he spent a lot of time building things. He made slingshots and model airplanes, and he built this device that allowed him to throw potatoes into his neighbor's yards, and he did get in trouble for it. He described himself as an independent thinker and wanted to become a writer. When he graduated from high school, he took some time off to try to get his writing career started. He was unable to write anything of value, became very frustrated, had a minor identity crisis, and decided that writing was probably not the way he wanted to spend the rest of his career. So he decided he wanted to go to graduate school and he ended up studying psychology at Harvard University and earned his PhD from there. He went to school there for several years, graduated in 1931, and then ended up staying on after graduation as a researcher until 1936. Then he taught at the University of Minnesota for a few years. He transferred to Indiana University and then came back to Harvard University to finish out the final years of his career. Throughout his lifetime, he published over 20 books and more than 100 peer-reviewed journal articles. That is also impressive. That is a lot of information. But that wasn't the only thing he did. He was also very supportive of his students and was able to, again, spread his ideas through his students. While teaching at the University of Minnesota at Minneapolis, he published his first book, The Behavior of Organisms, in 1938. In his book, he argued that free will is an illusion and that all behaviors are shaped by, conditioned by the environment. Now, he's not saying that free will doesn't exist. He was just saying that the idea that we have 100% control over our behaviors, that we decide how we're going to act all of the time, he didn't agree with that. He argued that there are many situations where our life experiences of being rewarded and punished for a specific behavior, those life experiences, the environment itself 
impact whether or not someone will behave in a certain way. And among the behaviorists, this was not an unusual idea. Many of them, remember, said the environment has an impact on behavior. Skinner took it to the extreme and basically said, this tendency is so strong, so significant, that there are very few behaviors that are not shaped by the environment. And the idea that we all have control over everything we do is an illusion. It's it's not really, it's not that simple. There are other things that are playing a role, namely rewards and punishment. Like Clark Hole, Skinner also believed that it was possible to predict human behavior with precise laws. He encouraged other behaviorists and other psychologists to focus on those things that could be measured. He spent a lot of time working with animals, and so it was relatively easy for him to observe the animals and record that behavior. But he encouraged other researchers to find new ways of measuring human behavior. He also described his operant conditioning principles, his methods, his procedures in this particular book. He also described the differences between his principles and Ivan Pavlov's classical conditioning. He recognized that his studies were related to, similar to, but yet the ideas were very distinct. And so he wanted to, right off the bat, explain to the world how his work was different from Pavlov's work. He used the word operant because he said behavior operates on the environment. Depending on our action, there may be a reward or there may be a punishment that arises in the environment. Skinner distinguished between what he called respondent behaviors and operant behaviors. Respondent behaviors are those like the ones that Pavlov studied. Reflexes that are elicited by a stimulus in the environment. Reflexes and they are instigated, they are drawn out, they are created by something in the environment. These reflexes do not apply, they don't explain all of the things that we do. Instead, he referred to everyday behaviors as operant behaviors. Includes everything from what time you wake up to the outfit you choose to wear, the food you choose to eat, what time you choose to leave, when you decide to do your homework, what you do at work, everything. All of your behaviors, according to Skinner, are operant behaviors. Your heart beating, your eyes blinking, sweating when you're nervous, those are respondent behaviors. Those are behaviors that you really don't have any choice over. They just happen because of what's going on in your environment. Operant behaviors are those voluntary behaviors that we have more control over and that are more relevant to the study of psychology. Operant behaviors are emitted, not elicited. They're emitted. And they are not a response to the environment. They're just the normal behavior. Skinner paid attention to what happens after that behavior and how those consequences influence future behavior. This distinction is important because his studies really focused on those operant behaviors. When we teach our animals how to do tricks, we are using operant conditioning principles and we are shaping what he called operant behaviors. Now this can be accomplished using two main processes, the process of reinforcement and the process of punishment. I'll describe them in a little bit more detail on the next slide. But the main idea here is that reinforcement encourages future behavior. Rewards increase the likelihood that that behavior will occur again. Punishment discourages behavior. Punishers reduce the likelihood 
that that behavior will be replicated in the future. Reinforcement encourages and punishment discourages. In order to carry out these two processes, he used several different techniques. And I don't have all of them in this lecture. I've got the three main ones here. There are a few other ideas that we just don't have time to cover. I have a lot of information to show you about Skinner. Here are three of the specific techniques with their definitions. Positive reinforcement. The positive stands for the addition of something. Positive means adding something to the situation. Reinforcement, of course, means encouraging behavior. So positive reinforcement is the idea that we add something of value, something the organism wants, like food or praise, after a desirable behavior. The experimenter's response, whether or not we give positive reinforcement, punishment, or no action at all, the experimenter's response, the environment's response is very important in terms of timing. It needs to happen right after the behavior. Sometimes people will return home from work and find that their pet has left a mess it does you no good to discipline your pet at that point. That behavior probably happened minutes ago, hours ago. The animal is not going to understand that that action from minutes ago and the punishment are related. The positive reinforcement, the lack of a response with extinction, punishment all need to happen immediately after the behavior. Skinner labeled the different examples of reinforcement. He labeled them reinforcers, praise, food, attention. Skinner also used a technique known as extinction in order to discourage future behaviors. Extinction is simply a lack of reinforcement, withholding food, praise, and attention, ignoring the behavior in an effort to make it go away. This works with some behaviors, but not all behaviors. When raising children, parents come to realize that you can't fight every battle. You cannot discipline your child for every single thing that they do. You will spend the entire first 18 years of their lives punishing them. So that's not possible. You will have to ignore some behaviors in hopes of it going away. This is called extinction. Not reinforcing those behaviors as a way of making it less likely that those undesirable behaviors will occur again. One of the problems, again, is that many of us end up reinforcing the very behaviors that we don't want to happen. We do it accidentally. We don't even realize that there is a reinforcer in the environment. Negative attention is still attention. And so there are situations where bad behavior needs to be punished and then ignored. Positive reinforcement is adding something the organism does want. Punishment is adding something the organism doesn't want, something bad, something that is considered negative. And we use punishment to reduce the likelihood that a behavior will be repeated. It is all about reducing the probability that an animal will do something again. So with pets, specifically dogs, when a dog does something that you don't want it to, say it barks or it jumps on someone, sometimes a quick touch or sometimes a verbal signal, no, I use ch -ch -ch all the time to keep my dog from doing things that I don't want her to do. Skinner called the different forms of punishment punishers. Throughout the 1950s, Skinner studied operant conditioning using two species of animals, rats and pigeons. By the 1950s, many people 
had had it with the May studies. That was like, that was the main way for behaviorists to conduct their studies, have these rats run through mazes. By the 1950s, people were tired of the rats running through mazes and were looking for other ways of studying behavior. So Skinner filled that void and he filled it with his work with pigeons. He published the results of these studies in a 1957 book called Schedules of Reinforcement. You can see in the image here, Skinner and his pigeons. And this is where they spent most of their lives. Their diets were controlled. The amount of training that they received was controlled. He really did try to document as much as he could and keep track of all of the different variables that would need to be controlled for in his analyses. Standardization was important to Skinner, just as it was to Watson, Pavlov, and the other behaviorists. In order to standardize his own studies, he built what he called the operant chamber. And you can see an illustration of it here. Clark Hull called it the Skinner box. And even today, you will hear most people call it the Skinner box but Skinner called it the operant chamber. These chambers had lights, speakers, food dispensers, levers for the animals to learn how to push in order to get the food. They had electric grids in order to shock the animals. Every rat experienced the same type of environment, the same light, the same sounds, the same electrical grid, the same size room, all of those variables were controlled with this setup. He would place the animals inside of the chamber and then record their reactions, record their behavior. He used what is called a cumulative recorder to record, document the rate of their response. So he would take notes and watch what the rats would do, write it down but he also used this recorder to measure the length of time between say a light and then the lever push. Imagine you are one of Skinner's graduate students and you're introducing a new rat into the experimental rotation. When you first put the rat inside the box, it's just gonna explore everything, sniff everything, look at everything. When the rat goes toward the food dispenser, you would want to drop a piece of food. When the rat has its back to the food dispenser or when the rat walks away, you wanna be sure that you don't drop any food. You wanna make sure that you ignore those behaviors. Sometimes uh, the experimenters would shock the animal when it would walk away from the food dispenser. The idea was to just keep rewarding it every time it came near the food dispenser. Eventually, the animal would have to touch the lever, eventually the animal would have to press the lever. But at first, you just reward the small behaviors like going towards it, looking at it, touching it. This was done only when the light was on. And that, that light was key. He would present the, the stimulus in the environment, the light or a certain sound, and then the conditioning process would start. So the animal learned that not only do they have to do something specific like press a button in order to receive the reward, but they also learned under what circumstances does this hold. When the light wasn't on, no reward was provided. No light, no reward. The animals learned this association, okay? That was very important to his experiments. Undesirable behaviors, again, were not reinforced using extinction or they were sometimes punished. After many, 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 many trials, the light gained what he called stimulus control over the lever pressing behavior. Because the rats learned that in order to receive a reward, the light must be on. If the light's not on, I might as well not even push the lever because nothing's going to happen. This shaping process can be used to teach animals, children, adults to do all kinds of things. In a very simple example, you can see here that he taught two pigeons how to play ping pong. Now they're not really playing ping pong, it just looks like it, 
he taught them how to peck at this ball, how to make sure that it stays on the table and goes across the table to the other pigeon on the other side. For us, it looks like ping pong. The birds are simply pecking at a ball the way that he taught them to do it. Although Skinner believed that all of our behaviors are in some way shaped by the rewards and punishments that we've received throughout our lives following these behaviors, he also said that we as humans have responses, have techniques, strategies, if you will, that we use to gain more control over our environment and these consequences. We monitor our behavior. We pay attention to what we're doing and how people are responding. We can change the environment by leaving and going to a different environment. We can redirect our attention, pay attention to something else in the environment. If we aren't receiving the type of reinforcement that we're looking for, we might need to pay attention to a different source of reinforcement. Telling other people about our goals for the future increases the likelihood that those goals will come to fruition. It puts a good kind of pressure on us to live up to those, those goals. So again, to recap, Skinner believed that our behaviors are shaped by the environment, but he also said that we have ways of gaining back some of that control and making decisions about what we do. Skinner had high hopes for behaviorism. Ideally, he wanted to create a technology of behavior in order to predict and control behavior based on his reinforcement principles. To fulfill his vision, he attempted to apply his operant conditioning principles to everyday problems. Project Pigeon is an example of one of those attempts. He taught a group of pigeons how to guide missiles. These pigeons were going to make a one-way trip on these missiles. The pigeons actually sat inside of the missiles. They were strapped in and they would peck on a screen. When they pecked on the screen, it would steer the, the missiles. He successfully completed the project. The pigeons did exactly what they were supposed to do, but unfortunately they were never used. The war ended before it was able to be implemented. Nonetheless, he successfully taught pigeons how to guide missiles. And you can kind of see the setup in the image on your screen. Skinner's ideas contributed to the development of behavior modification, a very popular form of therapy where the focus is on changing the reinforcers of a specific behavior. An undesirable behavior is modified, is changed by adjusting the reinforcers, the consequences of that behavior. Behavior modification has been used successfully to help treat millions of people of all ages people who have been diagnosed with mental illness and everyday people who do not have a diagnosis. One form of behavior modification is called the token economy. Using this technique, people are rewarded for desirable behaviors with tokens, some type of object that people can then trade in for things that they want. This technique has also been used in a variety of different industries. Some of you might remember the reading competitions from elementary school. The more books you read, the more tokens, the more credits you accumulated. And at the end of the year, you might be able to turn in those minutes, those credits for some type of reward. When I was a kid, the reward was tickets to Raging Rivers or to a St. Louis Cardinals game. Throughout his life, Skinner created and designed several different products that applied operant conditioning principles. He created one of the very first teaching machines for children. 
the machine that you see here on your left was designed to help children learn how to do basic math and how to help them read. The machine would present words and bits of information. The children would have to respond. They would receive immediate feedback from the machine in terms of right or wrong. The machine could also be adjusted to each child. So children who were doing really well could be challenged and children who needed extra help could go back and review the lesson. In 1944, during World War II, he and his wife were expecting their second child. He wanted to create a crib that would keep the baby safe. So he created what he called an air crib. And you can see an example of it here in the image on the right. The temperature was controlled, the size was controlled, there were walls and doors, the baby couldn't get out. Um, as you can imagine, some parents were not okay with enclosing their children in a cage, and so his air crib did not sell very well, but it was another example of Skinner attempting to apply his principles to real world problems. There is one more thing that I'd like to mention about Skinner and his legacy. Although he really didn't make a profit on his trained animals, his work certainly inspired many other researchers, psychologists, and entrepreneurs to figure out a way to make money from the training of animals. This entire industry really owes its success to, to Skinner. The last thing I want to do is summarize for you the differences between operant conditioning and classical conditioning. Both types of conditioning fall under the behaviorism umbrella, but there are several differences that I'd like you to understand before we move forward. Classical conditioning focused on what happened before a behavior and really focused on reflexes. Whereas operant conditioning focused on what happened after the behavior and looked at all kinds of behaviors, not just reflexes, but also things like two pigeons playing ping pong. Pigeons playing ping pong was not relevant to classical conditioning experts. That was not what they were concerned about operant conditioning was more focused on things like teaching your pet how to do something. Operant conditioning is sometimes referred to as type R. It is associated with B.F. Skinner, although some of the other behaviorists also used operant conditioning principles. It was officially created in the United States and again focuses more on voluntary behavior and what happens after those behaviors. Two different ways of studying behavior. Both of these ideas are important to psychology. Both types of studies contributed to not only the expansion of behaviorism, but also impacted the way that we study psychology, the way that we study mental processes, and the way that we study behavior. Thank you for tuning in to yet another lecture video. I appreciate your attention. This is the end of the fourth module. Next week, we will begin learning more about the history of the treatment of mental illness and how clinical psychology got its start 